So I'm inspired by Marion, who of course has changed the t You know, by the end, who knows what's going to be up there, okay? But I'm inspired in the following sense. Uh, you know, directors can actually do things and make them happen. So maybe at the break, we're going to change the seating a bit. I don't know yet what we should do, but when you're standing up here looking out, and Peggy and Eugene and Natalie, you should be, you know, you'll see that everyone's sort of spread out. It's sort of hard to make eye contact. So maybe what we'll try to do is make it a little uh, more like a family. So I'll look for suggestions at the break. Uh, anyway, welcome. And uh, I, I wouldn't say I actually dreamed about the conversations yesterday, but I thought about them a lot. And I thought they were very valuable. And uh, I had used the word journey early on, the notion that we're on a journey. Uh, and I think that what's important to stress in that regard is that we're not coming to a destination, but we are beginning a process. And I think yesterday was a really terrific day of conversation that did just that. And I know, I hope, that from all our different positions, museum directors, curators, academics, activists in your community, you are looking at issues and pulling out ideas that you feel you can apply to your work. And I think that is the greatest compliment this conference can receive, is that we find some utility in the ideas. And I just need to say, Marianne, there's much for me to think about as a museum director in North America. So again, thank you for organizing this. So this morning, we're going to talk about sharing of knowledge. I love these sort of casual titles that just sort of suggest something very simple. Um, wh where I went with that was the notion of different forms of interpretation. That's where I went with it. And I thought about the idea that interpretation in museums are words, they're images, but they're also display. They're also how we choose objects and how we put them in sequence how we emphasize them, how we create the context around objects. And so that notion of interpretation, for me, is at the core of how we share knowledge. One thing that, you know, I said yesterday, the word that was missing from the day before was audience. And the word that was missing for me yesterday was community. And one thing I'm going to be thinking is, how is community used to create knowledge? How does community come into the museum space to create knowledge? And when we say community, what do we mean? In curatorial circles in North America these days, it's common to say all museums are site-specific. They exist in their specific site. And I think that's largely true. I think what we're hearing at this conference is that there are many issues that, are, uh, that connect the work we all do. So that question for me is alive as well. As a museum only of its place, or how does it become part of a larger network? So we have a number of people to help us think through some of those uh, issues today. Peggy Levitt is the chair of the sociology department and the Luella Lemaire Slaner. Slaner or Slaner? Slaner. Professor in Latin American Studies at Wellesley College and co-director of Harvard University's Transnational Studies Initiative. Her most recent book, Artifacts and Allegiances, How Museums Put the Nation and the World on Display, was published by the University of California in 2015. Peggy has received honorary doctoral degrees from the University of Helsinki and from Maastricht University. She's been a visiting professor at universities in London, just relax, this is a long list, okay? <laughs> London, Oxford, Tel Aviv, Beirut, Cairo, Antwerp, Vienna, Singapore, Florence, Amsterdam, and Malmo. If we say it really fast, it'll be like a conceptual work of art. It's good. Her books include Religion on the Edge, God Needs No Passport, The Transnational Studies Reader, The Changing Face of Home, and then transi transi Transnational Villagers. Peggy Levitt. Good morning. I want to first say thank you to Marianne and Florence and Ruta for 
Um, really a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot, so I'm very grateful to all of you. And I'm also grateful to all of you for showing up this morning after a long three days. Um, I want to start by saying that I am a social scientist, and I spent um, a lot of my career studying museum, um, studying migration and moving towards the relationship between the migration of people and the migration of cultures. So now I've become increasingly interested in how migration changes culture and cultural institutions, but also how cultural institutions respond to migration and globalization. And that's because, and I hope this will resonate with you, when you walk through neighborhoods like uh, Kreuzberg in Berlin or the Balmer in Amsterdam or Washington Heights in New York City, you're likely to see lots of businesses that speak to people's attachments to their homeland. So um, check cashing agencies that send money back home or places that you could buy phone cards or travel agencies or buying food that people miss. And that's because more and more people continue to stay connected to the, to the politics and the economics and the religious life of their homelands at the same time that they buy homes and start businesses and join religious organizations and political and um, uh, parent-teacher organizations in the places that they move to. And this isn't just about labor migrants or um, unskilled migrants. Think about the many boardrooms and bedrooms of the cities that you know. And some of you are part of this class of people that also stay connected to their homelands, vote across borders, raise children across borders, um, and invest across borders. So as a matter of fact, um, whoops, can I have the slides, please? This doesn't count as my time, right? <laughs> yes? Well, I'll keep talking, and maybe you'll come up with it. Um, one out of every seven people in the world today is an international or an internal migrant that moves by force or by choice, um, often with great success, but more often with great struggle. And these people send a lot of money back home. So um, countries like Mexico or Morocco are very, very dependent on the economic remittances that migrants send. At the same time, they're also dependent on the social remittances or the ideas and practices and know-how that circulate between migrants and non-migrants and have the potential to transform in both positive and negative ways sending and receiving country life. And these high levels of, of movement create what some people have talked about as super diverse cities. So um, think about London or New York that were already diverse to begin with, and then you have people from a wider range of countries coming um, with a wider range of statuses, so education status, skill level, um, legal status, and that gets layered on to the existing diversity. So in London you have 184 uh, nationalities represented in the last census and 300 languages being taught in the public schools. Um, so for me, these challenges, these dynamics really challenge basic assumptions about where and how inequality and gender and class are produced, how and where people, um, family life gets lived, and how the rights and responsibilities of citizenship get exercised. So I think we need new social safety nets and new kinds of social institutions that um, respond to this reality. Um, but first, we need a different kind of vocabulary to talk about what the nation means, an understanding of the nation that doesn't stop at its borders, that understands that people can have multiple identities and multiple allegiances, and it's not a sort of zero-sum game, like I have to choose between uh, India and the United States. Um, and so that's where museum comes in, um, come in, because as you all know better than I do, museums have played a really important role in, in creating nations and creating citizens. So my, my question in the book that, that um, I take the title of my talk, if we can see it ever, um, is about is, um, you know, in today's global world, are museums creating global citizens? And what's their role in helping to create the diverse communities that we all 
um, care so much about and what explains why some museums do that more effectively than others. So we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of days saying that this needs to happen and that museums need to play a role. But what I want to do today is bring in some of the history and the context that helps explain the differences in how museums approach these issues. So really, what is it about cities that help explain um, why, where museums fall on what I call a cosmopolitan nationalism continuum and what do we learn about nationalism in a particular country by looking at its cultural institutions. So to try to understand that, I traveled around the world and interviewed 163 um, uh, curators, museum directors, educators, politicians, um, critics, and asked them about what they thought that they were doing, if and how they thought that they were creating cosmopolitans, global citizens. So global citizens not in the legal sense, but in a sense of belonging, feeling a sense of membership, incorporation, and also a sense of responsibility. And um, that's what I would like to share with you today. And so I'm comparing three sets of countries. So I compare museums in Sweden and Denmark. So that, that's a set of countries that are sort of over empire. Then I'm looking at museums in New York and Boston, so US that some would say are still stubbornly clinging to the height of its empire, I would say is starting on its way down. And then Singapore and Doha that are countries that are using um, cultural institutions to try to, um, uh, to try to claim, to build their nations, strengthen their nations, but also claim a more uh, regional, if not global, uh, role. And, but before I go into my, what I found, I want to say a little bit more about what I mean by cosmopolitanism. So it, it was not an, um, it wasn't a, a given for me, it was more of an empirical question. So I was asking people, what what do you think that you're doing with your work and what does this mean to you if that's part of your agenda? And it turned out that cosmopolitanism um, had three parts. So one was ideas and practices. The second was values and, uh, the, uh, first was ideas and values. The second was practices and skills. And the third was um, cosmopolitics or what's an actual vision of a cosmopolitan world and um, and how would we go about getting there. And those things don't always come together. So what were some of the ideas and values? Well, things like curiosity, tolerance, critical thinking, empathy, reflexivity, and an interest and a willingness to engage in people that are different, um, and, different and have to have different kinds of experiences. Some curators mentioned things like human rights, or gender equality, or democracy, but clearly these were more problematic in some countries than others. And cosmopolitics came up much less often and was much more difficult to agree upon. So at the end of the day, my thinking about this is that cosmopolitanism is a kind of willingness and um, the skill set that it takes to, and a recognition of the importance of engaging in a conversation about what our common ground might be. Not assuming what that is beforehand, but engaging in that conversation and being willing to um, engage with diverse, <coughs> excuse me, conversation partners to kind of hammer that out together. <coughs> so um, no museum that I visited uh, was entirely on the cosmopolitan or the national side of this continuum. Um, the nation was always seen somehow in relation to the globe and the, and the and cosmopolitanism was always kind of refracted through a national lens. Um, and the differences that I found between institutions have a lot to do with the many things that you all face every day working in museums. So museums are limited by their histories and by their collections and what they can borrow, what they can afford to borrow, <clears throat> and what they can get access to, and what um, curators' fields of expertise are, their, their sense of their comfort zone, let's say. Um, they also have to do with whether they're publicly or privately funded. So um, museums in Sweden are seen as instruments to pursue social engineering, for example, whereas museums in the United States mostly are 
privately funded and really have to think a lot more about visitors and, and donors. They have to do with whether a museum um, starts life as an art museum or um, an ethnographic museum. So what's your scope to begin with and then how does that shape you on your, on your trajectory? And then there's kind of a, an organizational ecology in many cities or a kind of implicit or explicit distribution of labor. So in other words, um, whether it's talked about formally or not, this museum does the national, this museum does diversity, often the diversity is, is relegated to the city museum, and so um, th that, that kind of uh, sets it up so that the other institutions don't have to do what that institution is doing. <clears throat> but I want to signal three other things to you uh, about what explains helps explain what museums do. The first is what I call the city's cultural armature. So that is the deep cultural structures or the kind of values and beliefs that the founding fathers, and usually they were founding fathers, laid down when they established a city's cultural institutions. I bet we could have a really great conversation about what that would be in Dresden. But I think that these kinds of um, values and aspirations and goals continue to echo and ripple in the bricks and mortar of the institutions today. And so it's about history and demography and, these kind, and this ethos, but it's also about the diversity management regime in place. And by that I mean how difference gets talked about, what kinds of words we use, how we measure those categories, whether diversity is seen as an opportunity or a, a, a problem, and then what kinds of policies get put in place. So let me give you an example. In the United States, we often talk about being hyphenated Americans or ethnic Americans. I'm a Chinese American, I'm an Indian American, I'm a Jewish American. And most people would not um, challenge that um, the American side of the equation because that's what being American was about to many different people. Um, and so you use that hyphenated status to take your place at the multicultural table. And that's why you see so many museums dedicated to the experience of particular groups, the Native American Museum, the African American Museum, the Museo del Barrio, which is the uh, museum in New York that's dedicated to the um, Lat Latino experience. In Sweden, we have sort of, or in Scandinavia in general, we have the exact opposite. The same labels that are seen as empowering in the US context are seen as leading to social marginalization in the Scandinavian context. So you're going to be hard pressed to find somebody saying, I'm an Iraqi Dane or a Pakistani Swede, and that's because. Uh, it's seen as, as a negative impact and we're not going to see a lot of museums that are dedicated to the experience of particular groups. So a second piece that explains where museums uh, fall on this cosmopolitan nationalism continuum is um, where a country is on in the global cultural hierarchy. So just like there are um, uh, a, a, a ranking of politically and economically more powerful countries, there are also countries that are culturally more powerful. And where you are in that ranking influences how much you contribute to and are influenced by what I call a global museum assemblage. And this is a package, a kind of loosely constituted package of ways of doing museum that I saw reflected all over the world in most of the museums that I visited. So ideas about how to display things, how to collect things, how to educate, how to interact with the public, that's, that's kind of um, out there and museums contribute to that and interact and take back from that um, depending on where they are in this ranking. So where do we see that global museum assemblage? Well, we see it in the proliferation of um, curatorial studies and a masters of museum education programs around the world. We see it in the expectation that a museum is going to have blockbuster exhibits and um, cafe, gourmet restaurants and bookstores. We see it in the, the uh, expectation that there is going to be an iconic building built by a select group of star architects from around the world. 
We see it in the fact that there's governance structures that are regulating this world, like the International Committee on Museums. And I would say that the biennials and the art fairs are not part of this assemblage, but they are certainly in conversation with it. And then the last piece is people like some of you, a transnational class of museum professionals that circulate either regionally, say throughout the Gulf or throughout Asia, and carry this assemblage with them each time they move to a new post. Um, and so uh, they're, they're, they're bringing what they've learned and then that negotiation between global cultural politics and national and urban cultural politics is influenced by this, this, um, th this intersection. So, and finally, museum practices have to do with um, where, where cities and nations are in their in the arc of their nation building and um, world claiming projects. So certainly younger countries like Singapore, like Doha, are using museums to kind of say what they are as a nation, but also to position themselves more prominently in the global, uh, world, regional if not global stage. Now I was going to show you some nice slides, I guess I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, but. I, so I'll go, and that, that then, then um, within time, right? So that's a good thing. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about what I wanted to express with those slides. So forgive me for being so um, uh, short, uh, short, what do I want to say, caricatured. That I'm just going to say very powerful things, but not be able to give you a lot of evidence to back them up. So what I wanted to argue, I wanted to sh take you around the world to Sweden, to Boston, and to uh, Qatar. And the argument I'm going to make about museums in Sweden is that they're inherently more global than most of the um, museums that I encountered. And I think that's for two reasons. One is that there is a sense in Sweden that creating global citizens is a good thing in and of itself. It's a good goal and that it also eventually leads to creating a stronger nation. And why is that? Well, Sweden has for a long time seen itself as a kind of moral exemplar to the rest of the world. Olaf Palma was said a long time ago that solidarity doesn't stop at national borders and Sweden was always trying to chart this third way and show through its social welfare system that it was a, a, a global moral leader. It's also a way to sidestep the national. So there's very, there's no national day in Sweden. There's very little talk of patriotism. And that's because that would make you deal with uh, incidents in your history like the treatment of the Sami, like um, eugenics experiments, and like your role in World War II that, that you don't necessarily want to talk about. So um, I, I would present, I would, um, argue to you that this is part of why Sweden falls on the more global side of the continuum. In the United States, I found that um, museums are much more parochial and that um, I was going to show you slides from the Museum of Fine Arts where Matthew is now the director. I did my work before Matthew was there so he can catch us up on what I um, what I looked at, but there is a new wing there called the Art of the Americas wing and it's four stories uh, high and you're supposed to be able to walk in on any floor and kind of get the punchline and the punchline is that American art was never just made in the USA. And, and, but it doesn't tell us a lot about what that means for looking outwards. So in other words, it tells us how we should rethink looking inward but not what that means for looking out. And that's kind of typical of most of the museums that I looked at in the United States because um, it, well, let's take Boston. Boston was a city that was founded by people who saw themselves as they said they were creating a city on the on a hill that would be the eyes of the world would be upon us. We'd be, you know, this moral exemplar. So it has parochialness in its roots and this kind of sense of people. The world should come to us rather than looking outward, and that is certainly reflected in um, the rest of the country that, for, that for many people see themselves American, equate Americanization with Westernization or globalization and has felt like the world needs to come to us and that is also reflected in, in um, museum practice. And then the last thing I'll say is just briefly about Qatar. So Qatar is a relatively new country. Um, when I was doing my field work, 
12 to 15 museums were on the docket, and each of these museums did double time. So they were part of a master plan that includes Al Jazeera in English, hosting the, the World Cup, having University City, which is a campus with American and, and uh, French and UK universities, um, uh, um, what else, Qatar Airways, to kind of say something to the Qatari people, but also to say something to the outside world. So to the Qatari people, the, these, these museums and this whole panoply of strategies says, we belong to a country, you should feel proud of your heritage, um, we have a heritage that's different than our neighbors, and, um, and we can take our place, and it says to the, to the countries of the world, we can take our place among, at the, table, the world table, and we're going to choose what we want from the West, and we're going to um, uh, and, and disregard what we don't want from the West. And so I was going to show you pictures of the um, Museum of Islamic Art, which was designed by I.M. Pei, a stark, one of the star architects that I'm talking about. And this does the work of saying, this is a country that's capable of having um, a, a stellar Islamic art collection in a stellar building. And then the uh, Arab Museum of Contemporary Art, which does kind of edgy um, exhibits like one called Tea with Nefertiti that includes a, 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 a um, Tupperware sarcophagus, does the work of saying we're also capable of inserting ourselves in the edgy world. We know, as one curator put it, and I'll just end with this, if you want to be, if you want to play in the global world, you have to be able to do global art speak. And so that's what that museum does. So I'm going to end there. I'm sorry about the slides, but i um, happy to give you more details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peggy, for being uh, gentle on the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, I made sure you couldn't show your slides. Uh, w by the way, what's going to happen is after the three speakers, we're going to gather up here and have a conversation. Eugene Tan is director of the National Gallery Singapore. He was previously program director of special projects at Singapore's Economic Development Board and oversaw the development of Gilman Barracks Art District. He has held various positions, including Director of Exhibitions at Osange Gallery, Director of Contemporary Art at Sotheby's Institute of Art, Singapore, as well as Director of the Institute of Contemporary Arts in Singapore. He is also currently a board member of CMAM. He has curated various exhibitions, including the Singapore Pavilion at the 51st Venice Biennale and the inaugural Singapore Biennale in 2006. Eugene. Well, thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Marion, once again, for inviting me to be here and to Florence and Ute for the kind arrangements. While the National Gallery Singapore is neither an, an encyclopedic museum nor is it in Europe, but I guess given the change in the title of the symposium, it's not so much an issue anymore. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, what, I'm going, what I'm going to be talking about will deal with many of the issues we've been discussing over the past two days, such as voice, who gets to speak about whose art and culture, as well as issues of inclusion and accessibility. But I first want to speak about the ecologies of art in Southeast Asia. As we all know, for an ecology to be healthy and function well, all the different parts have to play their role. And in the arts, this refers to the non-profit spaces, museums, galleries, market, etc. And however, when one part of the ecology becomes overly dominant, you get undesirable effects. In recent years, nowhere has the importance of the market for the development of art been more evident than in Asia, where amongst other things, the market for modern and contemporary Chinese, Indian, 
and Southeast Asian art have risen to record levels. This situation is, in effect, a conflation of economic globalization and cultural globalization, where art has now attained the status of an international asset class. The importance of the market has resulted in a situation where arts commodity status has, in effect, come to dominate over its other social, art historical, and aesthetic values. This can be seen when public museums and biennales in the region now follow directions determined by the market, either wittingly or unwittingly, or as a matter of course, instead of the reverse. As such, artists aim not for their works to be shown by public museums and institutions, but to be sold at high prices at auction. It is only then that the fame and recognition follows. Auction houses therefore become the main agents of validation, with the focus that they now have of pandering to clients and the market, as opposed to seeing it as their responsibility to promote critically significant artworks. And this has had detrimental effects on the development of art in Asia. Then there is also the focus on the contemporary, or rather the contemporary as the extended present or the future, through binales and festivals. The numerous contemporary art binales are the other primary way in which publics in the region encounter and learn about art. There are established binales such as Guangzhou, Yokohama, and Shanghai, but also in the newer ones. For example, this year, there will be two binales in Indonesia, and next year, three in Thailand. In the region, these binales, together with the art market, tend to privilege the new, the contemporary, what is happening now, but with little historical context. And yet, the consequence of this global hunger for new differences has been an illusion of art history. This is especially so in Southeast Asia, where the absence of effective art ecologies, including museums and university art departments, has meant that these art histories have never been fully understood and appreciated in the first instance. For example, until a new art history program was established as a collaboration between the National Gallery Singapore and the National University and the National University of Singapore this year, art history was, ne was never taught at universities in Singapore. The result is that what we are left with is a shallow present, a contemporary culture where digital images are massively circulated, consumed, but more often than not without much context. So given the way in which the publics in Singapore and Southeast Asia have come to encounter art, how can a new museum such as the National Gallery Singapore with the first long-term collection display of art from the region, get its publics to relearn the significance of art and its histories, as well as the inherent value of art for societies. The National Gallery of Singapore was opened in November 2015. It was converted from two national monuments, the former Supreme Court, which is on the left, and the City Hall on the right, both of which were constructed in the 1920s and 1930s. The gallery has two permanent exhibitions, one that tells a history about Singapore art and the other about Southeast Asian art. Through these two exhibitions, the gallery aims to examine the shared historical impulses in the region, highlighting the complexities and relationships between national and regional art histories. This purpose is further complemented by projects that contextualize local and regional developments within a wider global context. This is just some more images of the building. These permanent exhibitions at the gallery are something new for a Singapore-based art museum. While there has been an art museum in Singapore since 1976, with the opening of the National Museum Art Gallery, and then with the Singapore Art Museum in 1996, there has never been a permanent or long-term display of the art of Singapore and the region. So in, the, in addition to bring a sense of history to the art landscape, which as I said has been absent, what they also offer is an opportunity for a dialectical approach towards curating art history. Over time, the proposition set forward by the earlier ex exhibition hangs will change as we respond to the critical discussions within the institution, and very importantly, that the institution has with other art historians, critics, curators, and artists. The permanent exhibitions of the gallery also set a new precedent for art, ex art museums in Southeast Asia, given the scale and depth of these exhibitions. Each of these exhibitions feature around 400 works dating from the 19th century to the present, and they offer the most extensive surveys of the art of Singapore and the region to date. So these are some images of the Singapore Gallery. Now 
The history of modern art in Singapore that the exhibition presents begins in the 19th century and continues till today. Of course, it, it is also a history that is part of a larger regional context. But how can we move beyond a national narrative for art history? The answer is not simply to move towards a regional perspective. For what does a regional perspective mean? If trying to define Singapore as a nation is complicated, then trying to define Singapore as a part of a region called Southeast Asia is no less complex. The field of Southeast Asian art history is a relatively new field and has evolved considerably within a generation. Art historians have previously focused their attentions on individual countries within the region rather than Southeast Asia as a whole. Ten years ago, scholars would argue for the recognition of other modernities that contrast hegemonic notions of Western modernity. Today, however, researchers and practitioners have begun to move beyond the opposition of East versus West and engage in an inter-regional conversation. The notion of inter-Asia redirects our attentions to the interactions of an interpenetrated system. It's not about uncovering some underlying essential identity of Southeast Asia, but instead about constructing the region, constructing its complex and layered meanings as we look at the historical interconnections. And this is what we hope to do with our other permanent exhibition of art from Southeast Asia. And in engaging with the art of Southeast Asia, some of the considerations we asked ourselves were, does Singapore have the appropriate social, cultural, and political conditions to allow the flourishing of a critical consciousness of the complexities of the region? What does it mean for Singapore to become the place to speak with and about Southeast Asian art and its attendant visualities? How would it compare to other types of enterprises and forms of artistic organization already going on elsewhere in Southeast Asia and beyond? And can Singapore's institutional embrace of the region be achieved collaboratively, ethically, and sustainably? So the aim of the Southeast Asia Gallery is then to provide a regional narrative of modern art in Southeast Asia, highlighting the richness and diversity through shared historical experiences, as well as the key impulses to art making across the region. The current understanding of Southeast Asia is often framed through the economic political configuration of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, an approach that has its limitations. Therefore, it's also the aim of our Southeast Asia exhibition to complicate an understanding of our region in particular, and of regionality more generally. To address how we understand Southeast Asia as a geopolitical entity, but also as an imaginary, and by looking at the art that we have produced. So these are some images from the Southeast Asia Gallery, and it's housed within the Supreme Court, hence the, the kind of uh, colonial architecture that it has. Um, th this is in our 19th century galleries, and the, art, the painting on the right is by a Javanese artist, Radan Saleh, who actually spent about five years here in uh, Saxony and Dresden in the mid-19th century. And on the left are two artists from the Philippines. And the narrative continues throughout the 20th century, ending up with uh, contemporary art practices. So apart from the gallery's two permanent exhibitions, we also have smaller special exhibitions, which result from new research and further examine in more detail aspects of art histories that the overview in the permanent galleries cannot delve into. One such project is entitled, A Fact Has No Appearance, this exhibition looked at the impact of new ideas on art in Southeast Asia during the 1970s. This was explored through the work of Johnny Manahan from the Philippines, Ratsa Piadasa from Malaysia, and Tan Teng Ki from Singapore. These three artists have been recognized for breaking new ground in Southeast Asian modern art. The 1960s and 1970s were pivotal decades when artists around the world began to reject standard ideas of art making and presentation and resisted the role of commercial institutions as arbiters of value and merit. Steep in the conceptualism of the period, these artists questioned the notions of permanence in their work, each offering powerfully inventive ways to redress the concretizing of ideas as aesthetic objects. This exhibition is an attempt at telling an untold story of conceptual art. So some of views of this exhibition. And apart from these smaller exhibitions, 
or larger-scale special exhibitions aim to examine the links and relationships between the art of Southeast Asia and other parts of the world, recontextualizing not only Southeast Asia into larger art historical narratives, but rethinking all the art historical narratives through the perspectives of Southeast Asia. Reframing modernism attempted to explore new ways of looking at the history of modernism in art through an encounter between the collections of the Centre Pompidou and the National Gallery. Once again, we started with the question, how is modernism relevant to the development of art in Southeast Asia? But that question is not enough if we do not also ask, what can art from Southeast Asia teach us about modernism more generally? Um, reframing modernism did not follow a chronological narrative or a story of stylistic progression. Our goal was to unsettle the assumptions about the history of modernism by comparing artists from the regions of Southeast Asia and Europe. This exhibition's design reflected our attempt to offer different and multiple entry points into modernism, to unpack the problematics of influence, hierarchy, and linearity. The whole exhibition was built up by connecting one artist's body of work to another in a network-like structure, based on shared or intersecting approaches to modernism, ways of working, and conceptual orientations. So one of our challenges then is how do we build, a, build our public and to educate them about art and histories in a country which has, doesn't have a museum-going culture? I mentioned earlier about the lack of art history research. It is the same with regards to art, ed art education in schools, where there's very little of it, with the focus being on more practical subjects, such as math and sciences. Then there's also the challenge of our digital age, given the increasing pressure to embrace the, embrace the celebration of the future. For instance, by employing the latest technologies to entertain museum audiences, in much the same way that people today, particularly millennials, are accustomed to being entertained through the multitude of inter interactive digital devices that predominate their daily lives. So how do we get them to be accustomed to the experiences that artworks and museums can offer rather than virtual experiences? To this end, we have developed an app which not only functions as an audio guide providing more information about our artworks together with things like helping you navigate through the museums, but also to use it as a platform for art. So Unrealized is a project developed in dialogue with three Singapore artists, Himan Chong, Ho Zun Yen, and Erica Tan. It is a project that experiments and employs the digital to engage with our public to link digital artworks to the two long-term displays in our Singapore and Southeast Asia galleries. So while the content can be accessed on your digital device, it will only be activated when you are in the gallery or specifically in specific locations within the gallery. The projects by all three artists are part of their extensive engagements with questions around modern art and engages with the relationship between the virtual and the actual experience of the museum. And realize utilizes the digital to break down boundaries and explore new possibilities in telling the stories of Singapore and Southeast Asian art. So another strategy that we have is to engage young audiences and families and to highlight the exper experiential nature of art through our Art Education Center and our Children's Binale. So the Kapil Center for Art Education is a specially designed space by artists so that children and families can learn about art and art making. It is designed into different, different zones and to cultivate the appreciation of art in different ways. Apart from educating about art, it's also about developing innovative and expansive thinking in the young. And then we also have our Children's Finale, which opened in May this year. And it's very much an extension of what we are attempting to do with Art Education Centre. It features 10 interactive artworks and activities created by artists, especially for children and their parents, with the aim to inspire the, their imagination. It seeks to explore fresh perspectives and innovative methods of art engagement that contribute to the development of art and education and learning about art. The 10 artists in the Binale were commissioned to create works that were accessible for young visitors and to showcase how art can be engaging, fun, inspirational and educational. And together with the Binale, we also had a festival which happened uh, on a big field in front of mu our museum with a facade projection and all sorts of different activities as well. 
Um, to end, I just wanted to speak a little about our Yayoi Kusama exhibition, which just ended. Because it, for me, it merges how visitors uh, experience art today and also how they interact with it digitally. And uh, Kusama is really an artist of the internet age. And I mean, by this, I mean how her work merges this idea of sensorial experience, uh, which audiences today are looking for, and how, it, how this differentiates it from a virtual experience. At the same time, how they engage with it digitally. As you can see, many of them are in the exhibition taking these selfies, which they then share on their social media. So this is also something interesting and fascinating, which we also have to think about. So the scholarship and research on the art histories of Southeast Asia remains underdeveloped. There are still too few art history departments in the universities in the region. Moreover, it's arguable that in this part of the world, most attention is given to the spectacle of contemporary art in platforms such as Binale's art fairs and markets. All this has compounded a lack of awareness of the significance and relevance of art history in our understanding of art and culture today whether we are talking about the art of the past or of the present moment. And we hope that through our exhibitions and programs, we can redress this and raise a greater awareness of how the art of our region has developed, and through this, the significance of art for our societies. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene, very much. Natalie Bayer is a scholar and curator. She studied European ethnology and art history and ethnology at the University of Munich, and she's currently working on her PhD. In fact, it's good you're here, not at home working on your PhD, entitled Migration on Display, a study of the cultural and political discourse of migration in the museum. Her areas of research include migration, racism, cultural policy, the museum, and the city. Her professional activities include writing, researching, teaching, academic consulting, and curation for events and exhibitions, including uh, the exhibition Crossing Munich, Places and Images, Debates of Migration, New Perspectives on Migration, and since 2015, she has been a research assistant for the project Migration Moves. I have a hunch you're going to be talking about migration. I just have that feeling. Uh, at the uh, city at the Stadtmuseum in Munich, for which she created a course on the NSU case, a new exhibition space, and the Museum Laboratory West End. Welcome, Natalie. Is it coming now? Okay, thank you so much for the invitation and the introduction, Matthew, and um, I'm happy to discuss some of my thoughts um, that are um, embedded into my PhD project on one hand, and also my work, but I'm not really going to show or talk right now on my work, but we can do it afterwards, maybe, and uh, I'm talking about my analysis, mainly. So, so. Um, I, um, well, Matthew told already I'm researching about cultural and his history politics and museum discourses in Germany, mainly about migration versus the nation, I would say, and uh, my interest of, uh, my field of interest and motivation is to research how anti-racist struggles and strategies of former migrants have formed up today's migration discourses and museums. So uh, racism in Germany is different to some other areas. Uh, Germany has of course been an imperial stakeholder of the West European colonial project and its national socialism, uh, socialistic history plays an important role uh, for racist formations. Um, but uh, for the modern um, racism, I think uh, the German politics after uh, World War II um, to recruit workers uh, from uh, 13 different countries like Greece, Portugal, South Korea, Morocco or Spain um, are still very formative uh, for, for, uh, for what I analyze analysis as uh, racism. Uh, because the agreements were made mainly for industrial uh, production sectors, I mean, 
main, I mean, not only mainly, but only for the work for work sectors and industrial production sectors uh, and construction places or in the care sector. And these workers from abroad had to sign working contracts structuring the whole life conditions for, for example, residence permits, social access and civic rights. No federal agency, no workers' union cared really about mig migrants. Uh, so non-governmental uh, agency, for example, offered language court classes um, or other uh, uh, um, agencies uh, for social care. But besides those Gastarbeit state agreements, uh, people are and were organizing their own migration projects for personal reasons and with own uh, organized travels. But this history, this view of migration is usually not really represented in uh, today's talk about migration history. So since, uh, since or until uh, very recently, Germany has considered itself as a non-migration country um, until about the uh, end of 90s. And along with this, uh, public museums, archives, history books, etc., blended migration more or less out uh, of the cultural representation spheres. Um, since the 60s, public institutions like media, newspapers, uh, pictured migrants. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to. Um, how, how, how can I. Um, wie kann ich. This? Oh, I'm sorry. Completely forgot. Uh, jetzt muss ich mal nachschauen, ob ich noch drin bin. Ja, so, hier. I'm, I'm right. Uh, since the 60s. Mm, um, public institutions like media, newspaper, uh, pictured migrants as strangers, strangers and aliens and problem scenarios like and to endangering social cohesion uh, with legs and culture, manners and abilities, or as unknown exotic speciality for consume spheres to color up uh, the normal normal world of an imagined uh, majority. Around 2000 and until today, um, the representation shifted with a new red-green government that declared that Germany is finally a country of migration. Few years later, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, my fault. A few years later, uh, migration policies were implemented. On one hand, migrants from West EU members. West European member states are more and more equally treated uh, and the state policies are recruiting so-called high-skilled uh, workers and students. On the same time, asylum seekers and migrants from unpopular areas or with seemingly non-profitable resources are more and more confronted with new border defense politics and social boundaries. At the same time, we're talking about around 2005, uh, the Conservative Party introduced so-called integration politics, addressing migrants and their children, grandchildren, grand-grandchildren, grand-grand-grandchildren, I guess until the 17th uh, generations. Uh, um, so the so-called integration politics create ongoing differences embedding classical and new racist rationalities with high impact for social access and exclusion. My thesis is that cultural represent representation politics interdepend with federal border politics bonded to labor regimes. Citizenship, discourses of belonging and boundaries uh, for access are therefore a highly contested field for those who are affected by all the new nationalist racist discourses. The history of migration and its impact of social, uh, on social development in all spheres are structurally excluded from the idea of normal society. So, I mean, this, these are counter images I'm showing, and these are counter images that are never shown in museum exhibitions about, uh, um, about the history of society. So why working in a museum at all? What is it good for uh, if the state and its institutions mainly talk about equality but don't get over racism? 
this is my drive and this is what I try to find out while I'm working in a museum, in the City Museum of Munich. Since about 2010, integration policies are introduced to museums with papers and programs for cultural diversity and participation. But the main fo um, actions focused, only, um, focused in the beginning only the education sectors in museums with separated programs like guided exhibition tours in Turkish, in Spanish or in Arabic. So targeting so-called ethnic groups, although people don't want to be categorized in such re 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 reduction terms. Some few museums have started to collect objects and create small exhibitions about migration. In art museums, usually uh, migration is uh, more or less a sublimiting term um, for uh, the postmodern experiences and um, in history mu museums migration is usually still not a topic at all in permanent exhibitions or in a very small separated display um, um, separated from the rest of the history exhibitions. For example, one of this uh, exhibition was shown, but it's all, always a separate exhibition for short term. So two years ago, an exhibition in one of Germany's um, official federal history museums uh, in Bonn was exhibited. It was called Immer Bunter, meaning even more colorful, an exhibition that was created in 2015. Um, the advertisement poster and in transaction, which is uh, the image I'm showing here, combined all stereotype multicultural images from the 90s, such as a kebab shop housing also Vietnamese specialities and a hookah lounge. On the one hand, this tape's play refers uh, to an idea of making migration consumable to an imagined German majority. On the other hand, this imagination reduces the vast social impacts of migration to a few very superficial cliches. Representation problems like such uh, are found throughout the entire exhibition. For example, a giant photograph of a uh, five half knocked uh, Mediterranean looking man standing next to a completely uh, to completely clothed and considerably larger men um, who are inspecting their genitals. Actually, the photograph was taken from John Berger's well-known book, A Seventh Man, uh, with photographs from Jean Moore, which was published in Germany in 1976. The authors had uh, put a lot of thought into portraying a different, unofficial version of this history uh, by the depicting the persons and the photographs as actively taking part. I mean, if you see the whole project, there's a book, you can buy it in the store. It's, uh, there's a new edition uh, since some months. Um, it's a whole series and, um, and, and, and they write in the preface, uh, the authors write um, that they don't want um, the images to be shown separately. Yeah, but this is what the German museums do. Contrary to this, the exhibition presents the same image in a way that objectified the man. So Emma Bunta failed to take this perspective into consideration, um, although non-governmental archives and mig migrant historians repeatedly offered uh, to consult the museum um, for the contents of the exhibition, but the museum refused. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, in line with this logic, the exhibition had more to say about the motor ve vehicle, you see that down there, um, that was given to the one millionth so-called guest worker, the re uh, uh, Armando Rodriguez de Char, um, who, who was this one, one millionth uh, Gastarbeiter, passed away due to uh, health impacts because of heavy industrial labor. Um, but this is not mentioned anywhere in the whole exhibition. On contrary, uh, um, in the whole exhibition there was hardly any immigrant subjectivity uh, at all. Um, instead, the um, museum, the exhibition assumed German state's official position, understanding Germany as the main actor that was in need of workers to supplement their labor force and therefore turned uh, for, uh, um, 
I'm sorry, uh, and therefore turned to foreign countries to find workers, uh, which led Germany to become a more colorful country. Although this perspective is somewhat abstract, one can still identify with it. The main exhibition makers, professors and scholars, assumed this objective perspective as a normal given one. Those visiting, oh, 10 minutes. <laughs> Those visiting um, uh, German museums, well, traditionally well-educated middle-class um, um, people with no migration backgrounds or school groups, groups coming from bourgeois German education system, fit into this perspective to find a narration of their own country through a seemingly objective lens. In other words. This German us could observe what uh, happened after the migrant other came into our society. Um, yeah, this was one. Uh, these are some other typical uh, displays. Uh, when asked about uh, the definition and aims of this objectivity, the credo of my interview partners, which are curators and museum directors, is almost always scientific scientific Wissenschaftlichkeit and scientific approach, especially when it comes to historical exhibitions. This almost without fail results in a narrative from the perspective of the nation, the German state and the bourgeois worldview. In fact, the methods and references museums the, uh, of museums are largely self-serving. They for forge a perspective within a room where scholars, uh, curators, and bourgeois educated elites are among themselves who are socially positioned in, on equal terms. In the museum field, it seems to be incredibly difficult to escape this container. So the objective perspective is a social arrangement in this setting um, with mutual, mutual authorization principles to order the world. In the past 15 years, of course, a lot of other um, exhibitions were shown uh, with uh, interesting ways to find new na narratives on migration, but overall, the approach of uh, Imma Bunta entails many problems that can also be found in various other uh, museum exhibition projects today, and which stands in st very big contrast to what I call uh, anti-racist curating. So to consider about cu uh, anti-racist curating, we have to bring into the curatorial praxeolo pra uh, pra practice subjectivity, or rather subjectivation, um, along with finding ways of multi-perspectivity. So all the narratives and items on uh, displays must be critically questioned, where, uh, like whose history is told, whose perspective is privileged, which images appear, who reads these images and in what ways, who have, uh, how have the items on display been generated, where the, the texts come from, are the narratives and images meant to empower groups? Um, or, um, so these are the same basic issues of discussions, uh, of movements, uh, from history from below and from the feminist and post-colonial theory, which, although they have been ongoing for a lot of years and at least uh, 50, 60 uh, decades, seem to be today actively forgotten again and again. So what is anti-racist about anti-racist curating? To begin with, it is important to note that countries like Germany consider itself as a democratic society. So the demand of equal uh, visuality and multi-perspectivity is not something nice to have. It's a public duty of legal equality and democratic participation. In context of my work, I analyze racism primarily as a structural category of social inequal, inequal relations and dis, uh, divisions. Racism functions as an apparatus where exclusionary practices and processes of knowledge formations are contingent upon each other. Um, so exclusionary practices like material disadvantages disadvantages for certain groups are effects 
of unequal distributions and access, as well as over or under representation within the social hierarchy. So, racialization uh, is a process of knowledge formation by which the disadvantages are created by exclusion practices. As this, so you, maybe you understand this, um, this logic um, that, that links into each other very, very well. Um, as this, racist relations are not supposed to exist in a democratic society, they are, plain, they are explained like this. Certain groups have not attained equality because of certain national cultural lags. I mean, this is the classical uh, today's uh, um, explanation of integration politics uh, to, to, to me measure uh, cultural abilities uh, to become or not become uh, Ger German, whatever this means. So, racist knowledge is part of common social knowledge and it is not simply a prejudice or false judgment of individuals. This knowledge functions like an inverted mirror, viewing one's own society as civilized, peaceful, nonviolent, tolerant and open, makes others appear uncivilized, savage, violent and oppre oppressive. So, racist knowledge comes uh, to define a group as natural and in addition to formulate the, the nature of this group in relation to others own group, to, to others group. So anti-racist curating therefore needs to act in two ways. One is by emphasizing the public duty of a democratic state where exclusionary practices, particularly when we're talking about uh, public funded institutions, are meant to benefit the entire population. And on the uh, practical aspect uh, or praxis aspect, um, this is actually the point where it gets important uh, to question the democratic duty, who is meant actually. And within this process, there are number, numerous opportunities for involvement and collaboration that range from idea development to concept writing, educational considerations, technical planning, design, and setup. The point is basically to remove curating from the setting where this museum stuff remains among themselves. The fact of... Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 my slides are somehow uh, chaotic. Um, the fact of the museum's so-called opening is very deeply connected to migrant claims for equal rights. The, oh, time is up, I'm sorry. So what I want to say, my point is, I didn't come to this so far, um, that a lot of, uh, there's a history of anti-racist fights and group foundings um, who have inv uh, invented a lot of strategies that include basically collaboration methods in order to get out of this own very inclusive uh, uh, perspective and um, who have institutionalized um, collaboration methods um, in order to make interesting cultural work and uh, to stay political because it's about uh, getting equal rights uh, and equal access uh, to the cultural production. So I'm really sorry, I'm, going to, I'm not finished, but I'm going to discuss it on the plenum. I don't know if you're aware, but I have a monitor telling me time is up, so that's why I'm interrupting. So I'm, is this on? I'm going to ask each of you a question that will, I hope, perhaps take it deeper, some of the things you said, and then maybe you'll talk amongst yourselves, and then there might be some questions uh, from the audience. So uh, Peggy, uh, yesterday James said that we were sort of done 
that was his phrase, we were done with the local versus global conversation, but it seems as though you were going right back into it. So say something about local versus global as you think of the museums that you think about. Well, you said this morning about being site specific, and my argument is that uh, all institutions are um, embedded to different degrees in these kind of global spaces and influenced by these um, global museum practices. And the more that there's inter interconnections between institutions and the kind of borrowing and sharing and exchanging that we're all advocating for, and the more the um, professional field becomes globalized, I think the more you're going to see that. So there is this, it's, it's, I mean, calling it a continuum is to bring, call attention to the constant tension between the sides of the continuum and how they transform each other. So um, not to say that what you're doing in Boston or what you're doing in Dresden is going to be devoid of the local, but the pressures or the pressures and the opportunities offered by that global package um, will you know, also vary in how much they're present, but I think they will be there. Thank you. So we're going to talk about this all together, but I have a question for you, Jean, which is going to sound a little more aggressive than I mean it to, okay? I'm trying to be, okay. But you started in your talk by, ta by speaking about how contemporary art seems almost to follow the market and the demands of the market almost more than museums. Then you showed images of your museum in which the um, techniques and strategies of display, and in fact, the look of much of the art was very much formed by the market and by what I would call the look of an international style and all the rest. So how do you talk about resisting the market and trying to change a conversation in your community when the museum itself is presenting things that seem almost to affirm what you're working against. Well, I was speaking about the market in the context of Southeast Asia and what you didn't see and what we don't show are some of the artists who have become well known and recognized primarily through the market but have no significant art historical um, significance whatsoever. So there, is, there are some artists that have been made by the market and, and we, are, we are under a lot of pressure to include these artists in our, our historical narratives because these works are collected by the members of our board, by our stakeholders and the like. So that's something our curators have to uh, resist and be sure that the artists that we show are, are historically significant. You might also be referring to the Yayoi Kusama exhibition, for example. Were you? Yes, yeah, she's someone who has, uh, I suppose, gained the popular attention. Uh, really not, tr well, as I said, she was an artist, she's an artist of the internet age, and it's only in the late 2000s, uh, 2008, 2009, that she became really popular, really through popular culture, I guess. But that's also then a way how our publics in Singapore know about an artist. But what they don't know is how this artist started her work started in the 1950s, the development of her work, and uh, what, this, what it means to be an artist and what her work is really about. And that's, I think, the value that we bring to, to our publics, to show that, okay, this artist, you may have heard about this artist through, say, a collaboration with Louis Vuitton, for example. But come to our museum, you can understand why, why this is important, why her work is important. Thank you. And Natalie, I want you to help me with a problem. So two things. One is, I'm thinking about what George said yesterday about who is the we and who gets to invite and, okay? Then I'm thinking about a project that we're doing in Boston at the moment. This is going to end with a question, which is uh, that we are giving out memberships to naturalized Americans. So people who become American citizens in the state of Massachusetts, we give a free membership to. Okay? But 
we haven't figured out how to really connect those individuals or families to the museum other than to say here's an here is your pass so we're almost doing what George was saying was wondering about which is if you're just inviting like where's the connection where's the engagement where's the reciprocity so my question is what would be an example of something you've seen or an idea you'd like to float that would really connect the immigrant the migrant to a museum um, okay so now comes the part which I didn't mention in my paper. Uh, um, I tried a project this year in the museum I'm working at. Uh, it was called, I, I, I called it uh, uh, Museum Laboratory West End, which was, West End isn't part of uh, Munich, an historical part that is a, a, a part like a sec, a quartier, I don't know, you don't have this. Quarter, thank you. I'm sorry. Hmm? Neighborhood, thank you so much. As a neighborhood in Munich that is historically well known for as a workers' neighborhood and became a migrants' neighborhood in the 50s due to these workers' recruitment agreements. And so, anyway, so um, I made a project there. That's why I called it laboratory because I stayed there uh, for uh, for in different time sectors over one and a half year and I worked with a lot of people together I mean I have already I've researched I'm a migrant uh, migration researcher so I have a lot of uh, contacts and knowledge about uh, people actors institutions small organizations who are there um, some since the 70s some have found it up in the 80s and a lot of those um, small organizations actually were founded because the, um, this neighborhood had a problem with uh, uh, right-wing uh, groups in the 80s. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that they still exist, some of them still exist, but they have changed also their work during their years and to become actually um, and uh, not uh, migrant um, targeting organizations, but more for the whole neighborhood, because the whole neighborhood is full of people, full of workers, full of mothers, full of today rich people, and uh, today it's a highly centralized place, actually. So I worked with them very long together, and they know me, uh, they knew, uh, I mean, some important actors knew me already, and there was trust somehow, and um, I guess, and I started a long process, and um, I invited, um, I made some uh, workshops there in this neighborhood, and uh, introduced my project, my idea, my visions actually, to change museums, and, uh, and, um, and then I invited um, them several times uh, to workshops in the museum, and I showed them the museum behind the scenes, you know, we went to the collections, we went to the people who work with the materials who, uh, in the restoration and the repairing uh, uh, departments and the press department. They saw my poor office and my chaotic uh, desk <laughs> and, uh, and they get an idea who I am actually and, and so on and so on. So then we went again to, and then I told them um, I want to start a, a collective uh, exhibition pro uh, process and, um, and explained them. We made some little tests together and I also brought some objects from my family, from my mother. I told them a lot of my history and we brought it all together and we did some collaborative curating, you know, in a very small way. It was not public at all. That was maybe the point. It was not public, you know. And, um, and then we, together, we went back to, uh, to West End, to this neighborhood, and I asked them to help me. And I asked everybody to help me, and, uh, and I stayed there for some several uh, time. I did everyday workshops, and I was simply there and uh, we created an exhibition together. So I would say this is not the end of the story. This was uh, one of the steps in the process and it needs to go on and on and on. And, but the, the basic question is, I mean, this is one project, you know, this is one project, one um, sub-project of my project. The question for me is now about how to institute 
make an institutional uh, practice of the museum, but this is very much related to me, and I think this is false, you know. I think it needs to be, there needs to be a structure uh, um, that is able to work and that, that is uh, inclusive and welcoming everyone uh, without me. And this is my work right now, you know, and this is, uh, let's see what is happening, but I would say time is the key, time and, uh, and uh, yeah, time and presence. Yeah. Um, one of the most innovative um, programming strategies that I saw in my journeys was at the Queen's Museum, which is located in this um, park that's used by immigrants uh, every weekend to do lots of sports. And um, so they actually hired outreach workers. They were they were called community organizers who were on the staff and they would go into the community and do projects that um, always had something familiar to the immigrant community but was in the context of something very radical so some dance uh, performance or some you know art project but something that would allow people to feel like oh I recognize where I am and then the community organizers would say, oh, and by the way, there's a museum down the street, and you have, and we have ES, English as second language classes there, and we have, um, you know, uh, we ca you can host your um, dance performance for your children, Taiwanese dance performance for the children, and, and you might just look at some art. And so it, it, they, ref they, and this is a particular museum that has not a very big permanent collection and is not on the, the tourist circuit, so they have more degrees of freedom, but they're able to um, say, oh, you know, um, come on in and think about schools, think about um, museums as resources like schools and libraries are resources. And so I have a question for you, though, because I wonder, there's a lot of immigrants in um, Singapore, uh, immigrants, and I wonder whether there's a discussion in the museum community about um, doing outreach to that population. Yes, yeah, so um, that's something we've been thinking of, but one of the bigger issues is that our government decided that museum entry is free just for Singaporeans, people residents of Singapore. So this excludes all the migrant workers. And that's something we are trying to change, but having to convince the government, because it comes from a policy that, um, and I very much think that our museum should be free for everyone as well. You know. So it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing kind of a discussion, I would say. Do any of you have other questions for each other, or should we go to the audience? Do you want to? I guess I, I have a question for you because I was thinking there's a difference between um, having exhibits that are explicitly about the migration experience of a particular country or showcasing the experience of a particular group. But can we think about other ways that museums can use their permanent collections in creative um, re-storytelling that is not so much hit you overhead, here are these gastrobiters, but, but uh, also create openings and spaces. Um, because, um, you know, history museums, city museums, maybe are more likely to do the kinds of things that you were showcasing there. But what kind of things can encyclopedic or art museums do that would um, create those kinds of bridges? Well, actually, I think you're completely right. When I started to work in the city museum, everybody expected me to do a big uh, exhibition about migration history, and I refused. And my first work was to implement a display in the permanent, existing permanent exhibition about a, a racist motivated murder that had happened uh, in Munich and in context of the so-called NSU, uh, the National Socialistic Underground Party. It's a very German case. I don't know whether the rest of the world has heard of it, but um, there's an ongoing trial right now about uh, racist murder and bombing attacks and it's a big thing because the uh, three people could uh, uh, kill 
at least nine migrants, one policewoman, and uh, three bombings in na migrant neighborhoods. Uh, they could continue and continue and continue, and they could live in underground alive, but in underground meant they rented apartments, they went on holidays, you know, they lived a very civic life, actually, uh, because uh, in, ten, in the, those ten years, while they murdered and attacked uh, mainly migrant uh, people, um, Every time something happened, uh, the people, the, the victims themselves and their families uh, got suspected to be the real source of uh, criminal activities and migrant milieus and so on. So, so I did a display on this in the permanent exhibition. So my main work and battles in my museum is uh, right now the permanent exhibition and to find ways to break the existing because it's simply also not possible uh, due to material facts, uh, money and so on uh, to, uh, to do something new. I mean, I'm, uh, I suggested of course to make a new permanent exhibition about the whole society and to show on, uh, on this place uh, not migra migration as something special, that's exactly uh, the counterpoint, but uh, to to be part of urban development of this call, the, this rich Munich, you know, the city where I'm from. Yeah. I mean, I have seen um, in collecting practices the uh, struggle between, okay, we're going to collect um, uh, work by uh, um, painters, say, for example, of immigrant background in Germany. And so then do we make a special exhibit about that? Turkish German, for example. Are we going to make a special exhibit about that or are we just going to stick it in the National, National Gallery of Painting? And, you know, uh, what are the trade-offs involved with sort of ghettoize, including but ghettoizing versus um, inserting without some kind of indication that something different is happening here for visitors? Well, just one comment about it. I would suggest it's about the exhibition and showing the structures that make somebody as a migrant, you know? So, I know that. Okay, okay, okay. First of all, I want to apologize because I called you the audience a moment ago, and you're not the audience. You're colleagues and your partners. So I just want to say that that was a slip of the tongue, okay? Uh, so we have time for about 15 questions. I think that's right, right? And, and half hour answers. So I think we're gonna be okay on this. We have a relatively short period of time, but I saw at least three hands go up, so. Thank you, I try to be brief. First of all, thank you all you three You will be brief. Yeah, yeah. All, all three of you for these wonderful uh, papers. But my question is to, to Peggy, um, actually two, but very brief questions. And it's about language, because we talked about these various terms yesterday. And so there are these three terms that you used, or well, you used two, and I would add a third one to it, which is, you, you talked about multiculturalism, multicultural, and, um, and cosmopolitan. And, um, well, first, uh, I want to kind of put multicultural next to transcultural and to see if there are the kind of different analytical potentials of each of these terms. Because, and, and this is also linked to how societies look at this. Now, when we, we've been all, in all these papers, we've been talking about different groups and groups, identities, diversity within a society. And, and there's a lot about you know, difference, making difference visible, and um, even displaying it in the museum. What about all the unmarked, what is uh, with the, as society as a mainstream? And when I, uh, and we think, and I'm thinking of also of Drayston and the kind of programs we are doing here, and I think I'm very happy to say that transcultural has become the kind of analytical concept that you're using, because it also so means... I'm going to gently say what I said to the gentleman yesterday. Yeah. Can you yes. get to your question? Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, well, I'm just saying about the, and asking you whether that would not have a greater analytical potential, which would allow you to go to this large body of objects in these in museums which we identify as western or european and actually apart from sort of staging what is non-western is to say how to what extent have these been constituted by all kinds of relationship that's the first question and the second is you know you talk about cosmopolitan and my question to you is that 
um, even though we look at national differences in, in, the, in the three groups of museums you looked at, um, is there a kind of ethical common denominator that makes up, uh, even with all respect to national identities, and a lot of it is national rhetoric, and this comes to also a, a bit of personal experience with Doha, the importance of censorship. You know, where does, uh, you know, where are the limits of the cosmopolitan? Hmm? Okay. Remember that question? If I take yeah. more questions. No, I'm going to answer it really briefly. Yeah. You know, I think you're absolutely right to ask, like, what does citizenship mean in a context like Doha, where it means everything and nothing, right? So, if 12% of the people are actually citizens and the rest are this transnational class, I said censorship. Not well, but but censorship and and rights. I mean, I I don't think you can um, unpack disentangle them. So the, what does cosmopolitanism mean in that context? It's too complicated to try to answer. But I'll go to your first question, which is um, I, I'm, I don't want to get involved in conversations about which vocabulary is right, but rather to understand what, what's the deep roots of the vocabulary that's being used in a particular place. So what does you know, in Germany, what's the diversity management regime? Does it talk about race? Do we not talk about race? What are the words that we use? And therefore, what kinds of, and understanding how that um, uh, creates opportunities and closes down opportunities for moving forward in terms of these um, transcultural, multicultural, intercultural exchanges that you're talking about. I'm trying to understand, like, how does history and, um, uh, and what has come before shaped the conversation in ways that are pretty important and meaningful for me moving forward. We talk in the coffee break. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to your question in one moment, but Razul, your body language has sort of gone all over the place in the last three minutes, so you have to say something. It's just that um, I think it's much better to, they've had their chance. So rather than create mini conversations, we need to actually open it up. And they're, they're thinkers, they can remember. And then they get an opportunity to respond to the, to the issues. So I, th but I think um, um, Marion was before me. <laughs> and then I will. Thank you, so generous. Um, a small comment and one question. So a comment to you, Peggy, and to you, Monica. Um, so you spoke about cosmopolitanism and nationalism and the language and um, about empathy, curiosity. I only to tell a story from here. So I was in uh, one of these hardcore discussions inside the Frauenkirche with many people from Pegida. Um, and there was also a question about which language we use. Um, and there was a great xenophobia inside the, the space. And um, so some people said, oh, we have to be tolerant, so we have to include the word tolerance. And I said, no, that's not enough, we have to use empathy. And they, there was a very aggr aggressive reaction towards me. Um, and I thought, how, because we had this discussion from yesterday, we should um, speak about a we and include everybody, but it's very difficult to, to create this, to define this we, when you have people among these who have this xenophobia. This was only a comment, but a question to you, Eugene, very shortly. So I'm very fascinated about your, of, of your idea of the children's biennale. And this concept that you have these um, global, international biennales, um, very much connected to the international art market, and in a way have nothing to do with these local and regional traditions. And and to you, could, would, do you think it would be possible to use these children's biennial as a real force and power to create something different, which is really coming from Singapore, and, but also have perhaps an international influence, not only a local phenomenon? Yeah, so the, the use of the term Binale for this event is, is also kind of strategic because everyone knows what a Binale is and a kind of an arts festival but creating one that's specifically targeted at the, the children in the, in the country. So something that's, that's very specific uh, locally as well. So we, we commission mostly artists from Southeast Asia and Singapore to, for this uh, Binale. 
And, and it goes back to this relationship between the local and the global. How our audiences today are looking kind of thinking globally, looking globally, but at the same time, it needs to make sense to them you know, uh, how this actually really means, uh, what it means for them in a very kind of a real physical way, you know. And yeah, so I guess that is, that's the reason, be, the thinking behind the children's finale. I, we didn't think of how this can be extended into a much larger project, but it's really about how we are building our audiences. And, and um, yes, I said, given the lack of art education in schools in Singapore, starting at a very young age is a very important kind of mission for us as well. Thank you so much. Um, I would uh, come back to another perspective. Um, it's a question to um, Peggy and to Eugene. Um, it's my, 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 my uh, opinion or my, my question is, um, what is the link or what is your experience um, in the museums you have, uh, yeah, you, you are responsible or you have uh, uh, visited? Uh, what is the link, what is the connection to the local or global, uh, uh, local uh, or regional uh, roots of art? Um, are these included in modern and contemporary uh, art museums? Um, but, um, it's, it's the reason for, 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 for asking that is um, are, are, are two uh, points. Um, I'm, I have an experience in Africa and I uh, saw and watched in the last years especially the very deep um, um, reaction or the very deep realizing of their own local roots in contemporary art. It's not. It, it's it's uh, seen in the academic, but also in the in the non-academic uh, uh, fields of, of doing art in, in, in Africa. And the second is I'm um, um, yeah, a colleague of the of the ethnographic museums here, and we are looking and watching and searching ways to um, include the so-called traditional collections, cultural collections and art into, the, in, in, in the two, in, in, into a new perspective. And that's why for me the, it's very interesting to see or to hear about your experiences in the other parts outside of, uh, of Europe. What is, is going on there? What, is, uh, what are your experiences? Thank you. So if I get your question right, it's about how, how are we uh, presenting the roots of our artistic culture within the exhibitions, collections of our museum. Um, well, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, this is the first time there is a permanent display of the art history of Singapore uh, dating from the 19th century. And pr we've had art museums before this, but never a permanent exhibition. So there was never a way for our audiences to understand how our modern art started and how it's developed to the current day. Even though the collection that uh, we have inherited started in the 1960s, even before we became an independent nation. Uh, hence, having this permanent gallery is one very important way for our visitors and our publics to understand uh, the influences of the art that uh, have shaped uh, the works of these artists from the 19th century to the present day. Um, but we also have another museum in Singapore called the Asian Civilizations Museum, which deals with the pre-19th century art. And of course, uh, at the, uh, the boundaries of both our museums, this is a blurring of the boundaries, and we, of course, include both our museum's collections in each other's uh, exhibitions as well. I think we're running out of time, but Rosie will take us to the finish line or get us to the starting line or something. I suppose, um, you know, just following this.
conversation. It's, it's becoming more and more apparent to me how a lot of our discussions, which seemingly are about how do we attend to the legacies of uh, ethnography and of anthropological collections, are actually about reinventing the West and about shoring up what we mean by Europe. And so, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it's just something that I've been thinking about that, you know, so, so the Humboldt Forum is actually about the making of Europe. Um, and and it's, it's, it's particularly interesting in a society such as Germany, you know, where there's, this, there's such a, a presumption of Westernness as fully formed and stable, whereas in fact it is being invented by certain alliances and certain notions of, and the presence of English speakers in German discussions. And, you know, because, and, and, and it's very interesting to have this discussion in this Eastern part, this Eastern, in a sense, non-Western part of Germany that is being brought into the West and into the assumptions of, of the West. Because, and now to, to, to connect that to, to Peggy's discussion, just very briefly, I was reminded so much of, I mean, there's, there's, there's one whole concept that we haven't brought into this discussion, and that is the concept of museum as development. And we've, you know, on the African continent, we've been the recipients of museum creation as development. And this was spearheaded at a certain stage, particularly by the Swedes, on behalf of ICOM, where a number of museums in South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, were part of the Swedish African Museums program which was about the bringing of development aid. But what the Swedes got in return is you know, a, a whole line of creative thinking about how to remake their own museums. And what is quite interesting is that at a certain point, all of those initiatives on the African continent were destroyed. They came to an abrupt end. And it coincided with the, for me, I was, yeah, just a, 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 occurring to me, how it coincided with this moment when the British Museum sought to enter into partnerships with African museums. Because the problem is that we exist in such a rigid division of labor of where expertise is located and who are deemed to be the recipients of development aid. So that the expertise is never assumed to be in Africa. The expertise is always presumed to be in Europe. And we need to be able to think about how we can destabilize and relocate that expertise because it is only then that we will develop new possibilities. Monica, I feel I cut you off. Do you want to say something before we break? Do you want to give us something to think about, or you want to just come in later on and say some more stuff? You say, okay. You don't. Actually, to go back to what we were talking about yesterday bring back this thing about audience in a very central way and how do museums conceptualize their audiences how do they think of communities you know and so, yeah. so I just say one thing in response I think that goes to the the um, the challenge of rethinking the space in which museums are operating so I mean just as I was started with this idea that people live transnationally well so 
it's your comment is about how this is not a national thing. This is not just happening in Germany or South Africa. This is this intersection of people and money and interests and power that's taking shape in this global field. And, and, and so if you use that analytical lens, then you can at least try to fight back in a more effective way. I'm going to lose my job if we don't take a break. So thank you so much, all three of you, and thank you for the active participation.